support your arguments or for this strategy? I'm wondering, has this been extended to strategic settings? So, so I think the question is whether uh, strategic settings have been considered in uh, organization, if they are. Um, so, there are several aspects address that. One of them is tool <laughs> dynamics or argumentation. So the question is, broadly speaking, let's say to a, let's go to two agents, and so the two agents at least agree on what are the, the possible attack conditions. So if you put forward some argument, you don't you don't argue about whether something that has something or not. But uh, one of them might know some arguments, some others know other arguments, and they might have a model of the other agent and what the other agent knows, and then the question is how to go up, which, which argument to put forward in order to win, given uh, your models of your uh, uh, opponents. There are other approaches that uh, are trying to do to, to, to solve these, these aspects uh, in terms of probabilistic uh, reasoning, and uh, uh, I think that uh, they were actually transforming the entire program from a phobia to something process and try to solve it uh, in an efficient way. Unfortunately, the, the, the complexity exposed that. Um, I think those are the two main broad areas of what we're discussing. And then there is, in general, the aspect of dialogues are pretty big in terms of what we're discussing. How, how forgetful can be the agent? So if you put forward an argument, whether the argument is still alive for a long period, or they might just disappear after a period of time, so we are still focused on time and not the location. So they said uh, I have no choices, but what they have to do is that Yes? There's some work done Of organization. So the first volume of five. So five thousand pages. What the question? We all need a copy. And uh, we will be back in uh, twenty minutes. And follow.
Slide, uh, 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 Sì, vengo a pisciare anche. Vabbè, tu vai, poi io arrivo. Uh, uh, uh.
the reason for the summation of the problem. Okay, <laughs> well, I will try to send you another email. Oh, please speak up. Oh, well, so I just got the Dove è il browser? Ti spiace se... Come cazzo chiudo? Ok. Questo non ti serve? Questo ti serve? No, non sei più male. Oh, non ce l'hai in fondo, scusa. In un altro. Passiamo nel programma. Ah, guarda, no, so cool. That's interesting.
muchas brujas. Que no es un laptop.
Welcome back. Uh, before leading the stage to Mauro, um, we just realized that uh, although we've been asked to provide a link to the organizer, the Ishkai organizer, there is no actual link on the website of Ishkai, or at least no that uh, we managed to find. So this is a shortened URL to a web page that now contains nothing. It in one week time, it will contain all the slides uh, and uh, potentially also links to um, uh, a set of handouts uh, with some additional links and pointers to other resources and uh, YouTube videos, etc. So if you uh, want to, right, I, I will just give it on uh, also at the end of the tutorial. So if you do not manage to copy it right now, it will be later on. Otherwise, just Search for my name and send me an email more than happy to communicate with So we are committing to a one week time for publishing everything on the web. Let's say one more time. Excellent. <laughs> this <is> book. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, shall I so move back? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yes. Excellent. So this uh, second, actually after the tutorial, uh, should be maybe as the title of the tutorial is from theory to practice. But we are slowly moving into the practice side. And actually, I realize that practice is not the right word because we're not going to get our hands dirty. We're not going to write any code. We're not going to solve anything. But uh, let's say instead of practice, uh, we're moving into the pragmatic side. So we now understand, and we should have at least a clear understanding of what is argumentation, what it says about, how it works, how we can use that. Uh, the question that we want to answer in the second part is, where shall I start? So I have problems, I want to solve them. How do I pick up the best solver? How do I improve the performance of a solver? How do I change the formulation of a problem to some extent in order to be able to solve it from an operational point of view in a time which is okay for my need? And uh, in order to deal with these sort of questions, uh, we will go through three main parts. So first of all, how can you assess the state of the art? It is right now, thanks to competition and communication, it's plenty of solvers that you can use. How do you assess if they will work for your case or not? Second point will be, let's analyze the actual state of the art in a communication, and this result will focus on the ICC MA competition, which is an abstract argumentation competition from 2015. There has been a newer one, which was done in 2017, but we only have partial results so far, so we're not digging into that right now. Hopefully, the full results will be available by the end of September, and you can find that by Googling ICCMA. And the last point will be okay, I picked up a solver, uh, I formalized my problem, I have to which problem I want to solve, I formalize some argumentation framework, so I know the class of argumentation framework that I want to deal with. How do I improve the performance in order to meet my threshold, in order to meet my expectation or the expectation of my customer, for it? Okay, so let's start with assessing the state of the art. And yeah, let's put our step, as we said, in the shoes of, okay, I understood the limitation, I know how it works, I want to be able to pick up the best solver. Or, which is the same subtitle, how do I compare solver in a fair way? Or, even better say, how do I read results from competition? Or, how do I understand the state of the art? And the third thing that you need in order to compare solvers uh, are standards. So the thing which is usually done is uh, I define some standards so that I can fairly compare solvers. That's because, uh, especially if you are speaking about an application-oriented uh, development or an application-oriented deploy of techniques, uh, usually you don't have enough time, computational power, you don't, you don't want to be bothered running everything which is available. 
uh, or we don't have enough benchmarks for performing uh, some sort of reasonable and reliable analysis. So you rely on results from competition. And but for comparing systems, you need standards. Standards uh, that usually focus on languages. So in order to be able to compare systems, uh, you need to have a language which can be understood by all the systems for the input and clearly for the output. Uh, and you need benchmarks. A set of benchmarks which need to show some sort of properties. So they need to be challenging, they need to be diverse. And uh, from your perspective, it is not usually the case when you're doing a competition, they need to be representative of the instances that you want to deal with. If you clearly, you may have uh, benchmarks which are already available, or you may want to generate benchmarks which fulfill these sort of properties. Now, I'm not specifying, uh, and I leave it open on purpose, what challenging diverse means, because this may vary according to the sort of analysis that you want to run, according to the number of solvers that you have, according to the kind of domains and the kind of problems that you want to solve. But uh, from uh, a very high level perspective, we can say that the larger and more diverse is the set of available benchmarks, uh, the higher is the probability that the results uh, generalize well on a different set of problems, very likely on the ones that you really care about. And uh, focusing now a bit more on argumentation, uh, Berlin proposed a number of techniques for generating benchmarks. As we've seen before, an argumentation framework is, at the end of the day, a directed graph. You have arguments, you have relations between arguments, which can be attack, support, or things like that. In this case, we're focusing on after argumentation of the Doom's framework. So in this case, we will say only we we'll focus only on cases in which you have attacks, sorry, arguments and attacks. Uh, but at the end of the day, since you can represent them as directed graph, it can down just to creating different graph structures, which will lead very likely to very different results in terms of the problems related to the semantics and to the extension that you can compute. Uh, so, okay, the first naive way can be to generate truly random framework, and uh, otherwise you can move a bit further and say, okay, there exists some graph structures which have been uh, studied in literature, mostly by mathematicians, uh, so we can have a bad structure, a screening, Garabasi Alder, or you can focus on aspects uh, which are more related to after argumentation, or argumentation itself. So you may want to have uh, uh, some frameworks which uh, a large number of stable extensions, or which has a large number of strongly connected components. And another uh, approach that you can take is generating frameworks by focusing, uh, or by considering actually, applications. So some examples which have been done in this area are in planning. So what you do is you generate uh, what is called the planning graph, and you analyze the planning graph for extracting some information that may be useful for you from the point of view of argumentation, or you analyze the way in which Wikipedia pages are related to each other in order to understand an overall or an underlying structure. In these pages, in order to extract, uh, let's say, content or flows of information from different pages, and other examples which can be taken also from the application that the risk of shown before. So, and he said that in the, in the documentation community, there are standards, there are benchmarks, we can compare everything. So, the problem is solved, basically. You just look at the result, you pick up the best solver, it will be the best for your case. No. It will be too easy. Uh, there are problems related to competition, which are very well known in a number, let's say, in, uh, in communities or in areas in which competition has been more established, let's say like SAT, planning, or ASP, for instance. And uh, one of the problems is what is called the sources of performance variation. 
what you observe in a competition is affected by a number of sources of variations that you will see in a minute. So what you observe in there works for the settings, for the environment, for the competition, but the result that you can get on your own environment, on your own problem, can be very different. And uh, as I said to Arnel, it's not only a matter of low-level details. It's not only a matter of engineering. There are some sources that can be extremely important with a strong impact in uh, more general cases. So let's now enumerate and go through them one by one <coughs> with some examples, these examples. So third thing, which is extremely important, is what is called the solver randomization. So when we are dealing with a solver, uh, we know that solvers tend to be uh, extremely complex, uh, and sometimes you have to break some types uh, according to a heuristic that you are using. And how do you break this type, or how do you restart uh, your research using some random seed? These random seeds uh, dramatically affect the performance of systems. So, given the fact that in competition, very likely, you just compare systems according to one run or to a very small number of runs, uh, the final evaluation may or may not be biased in some direction. So, for supporting the task, let's take a look at results uh, <coughs> from uh, the SAC 2014 competition. Uh, uh, it was in the application benchmark track. And here we have the top three solvers. Uh, so, Linjonin in blue, uh, Risk Laptop in green, and this one in the three in red. And uh, what the, the authors of this paper, which are very Sullivan and all of did, is okay, let's take these three solvers, which are randomized, and uh, let's run them 10 times. Uh, on the benchmark of the competition, and let's check the number of problems which are solved. <coughs> uh, now you can see that the, the distribution can be very different. So if you are taking Linjonic, which I think was the winner probably of the competition, uh, it may be able to solve 100 and uh, only something problem, or 175, according to the lucky, how lucky you are with your uh, uh, random seed. And it may dramatically change from being the winner to being the solver in the first position. You can't do much about that in the competition. So I'm not saying the competition are wrong, I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is that it's important to know how to read the data in order to pick up something that fits for it. And uh, another source of variation uh, are the leads when you are performing an empirical comparison, an empirical evaluation, uh, you have to set some limits. One limit is in terms of the cut of time. So I will give you a few hundred of seconds for solving a problem. If you can't solve it within this amount of running time, I will consider that you are unable to solve it. And similarly, I will give you a certain, <coughs> sorry, a certain amount of memory, some gigabytes of RAM that you can use for solving. And if you need more, I will believe that you are not able to solve the problem. And uh, clearly, intuitively what you would think is that more running time or more memory will result in some sort of fair uh, increment of performance for all the solvers. So it, this is not really the case. So we've done some experiments that we run uh, uh, considering uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, the solvers from the uh, planning competition run in 2014 for the optimal track. So what you really care about is the coverage, and here we are uh, plotting the result of coverage against the available memory limit. And what you can see is that uh, the number of gigabytes that you are giving to a blender can dramatically affect the performance in different ways. So, okay, let's say that four gigabytes is some sort of threshold, which was um, the amount of RAM that was given for the competition. But as you can see, there are some solvers like Simba, uh, which can, which have some sort of step of 40 problems, which can be solved as soon as you provide it with two gigabytes more. While there are other solvers which are not affected at all, or some others which can 
somehow leave them to say, uh, exploit them, the available amount of RAM. So again, looking at these results, you have to consider the fact that they can run on some specific machine with some specific limits, uh, which might be similar or different to the limits that you're going to exploit. And uh, another point is, again, related to the machine, hardware and software environment. There has been some analysis, here I'm referring more to the planning community, in which they show that uh, uh, the software that you are using for running your system, actually the version of the software that you're using for running your system, can affect the performance. So we ran some experiments, again, on the lab competition, and we said, okay, since uh, most, uh, in that case, planners, uh, are based either on Java, on C++, or on Python. Let's check how their performance are affected by changing uh, the version of the C++ compiler, the version of Python, and the Java version. And here you can see, in terms of coverage, how they are affected. Again, there are some sort of, like Probe, which are not significantly affected, just, uh, I think it's just uh, a couple of instances of difference, but some other solvers, like Ibacop, for instance, uh, which is very sensitive uh, to the version of, uh, what was that? Yeah, to the version of the C++ compiler. One version, which is actually an older version, uh, allows the system to solve 10 or 15 instances more, while the newer version of the compiler detrimentally affect the performance of the software. And similar results have been observed also in different competitions or in different tracks of this competition. And uh, another very strong source of performance variation is actually uh, the set of benchmarks uh, or the distribution of benchmarks uh, that you are using uh, during the competition, so which is used for comparing the solvers. And uh, as we said before, benchmark should be challenging, so not trivial, which means uh, all the solvers are able to solve them in uh, a very short amount of time, because you need, uh, you need the benchmark uh, uh, to, uh, let's say, to decide or to compare solvers and to identify a winner or not. But you don't want them to be too hard, otherwise none of the solvers will be able to solve anything. So we remain with no information at all. And open questions in this area are clearly how to create them. So we have seen that for the implementation, you can create them by changing the underlying structure of a graph. But this is only the question from how to create them to which sort of graph structure is interesting or important for my application. And the other question is really how to select them. We have some examples of from the SAP competition, in which they uh, divide instances in empirical hardness classes, which means you generate a large number of benchmarks, you use some solver, and according to the time which is needed by the solver uh, to solve the benchmarks, you classify them. And you consider that there's some sort of guidance for the empirical hardness. And some similar work has been done also in the IPC and in the very recent uh, uh, argumentation competition, the 2015 one, uh, sorry, the 2017 one. And uh, why does uh, the selection of benchmark affect your choice of a solver? Because clearly, uh, the benchmark which are being used for the competition are usually very different uh, from the ones on which you will be working. So you must be aware of this point. And the last thing, so source of performance variation, is the ranking mechanism. How do you order, how do you rank the solvers? How do you aggregate the results in order to award the system as the winner, or the runner-up, or third position, or whatever? Uh, so the question that you have to ask yourself when you're looking at the result is, is the metric which has been used by the organizer of the competition a metric that I do care about, or not. And uh, the ranking that is included, if 
study which is minute in the sense that you can have rankings which are absolute. So in the argumentation of repetition, they use an absolute ranking in the sense of we are just counting the number of problems which have been solved. So this is absolute. Regardless of the competitor, the specific system will always have uh, the same result. According to the fact that all the other sources of variation uh, do not vary. While in the planning competition, for instance, you have some uh, relative ranking, in which case it is evaluating the performance of the system according to the performance of the other competitor. Which means that uh, if the same system is compared with very different systems, its performance will change. How much? You don't know. So, for concluding this first part, I don't want uh, to leave you with the take home message that competitions are not useful. They are awesome, they are fantastic. Also, for a number of reasons. Because, clearly, one of the main reasons for having competition is to foster the advancement of the state of the art. So, you have a clear deadline, we usually work on deadlines. You know that you have to deliver a system by that date if you want to take part in a competition. So every round of a competition gives to the community a huge amount of new solvers which can be used. Competition provides a large set of benchmarks and support for standardization, which is great for comparing. Uh, <clears throat> and also, that's some sort of byproduct. Uh, they can highlight issues that need to be taken by the community. So you can identify if some areas are not receiving enough, enough attention or you are not able to generate benchmarks because all the applications are very similar or uh, there are some issues in the sense of the size of the benchmark is too small to allow these solvers to be used in a real world environment. Yes? Sorry, just to ask, I don't think you are. In the system I showed before, the CS basis, we managed to actually create something working because of the ICTLA 2015, because me and colleagues were participating and we developed a solver that we actually used in, in, in the other system as well. So uh, I, I, I would like to stress that competitions are very useful. And without those competitions, we would not have uh, the few working systems in argumentation right now. Sorry, yeah, no, exactly. That's a, exactly the point that I wanted to make. So, the point is, competition are extremely important. They are super nice, and we are very happy that someone from time to time volunteered to organize them. It's a great burden, by the way. And, uh, but the thing is that you cannot blindly track the results of a competition. You know that there are sources of variation, and so you can take the results of competition as some sort of high level guidance. You can pick up probably not just the best solver, but you pick up uh, you pick up the best five or ten solvers. You can believe that they work reasonably well. Now finding out which one will be the best for your specific application that can be a different sort of question that you need to find. And uh, yes, yeah, an answer actually you need to find. Questions we are plenty. Uh, now having said that, so we know that there are criticism. We know that there are very good strengths and weaknesses for competition. But, in some way, they are defining the state of the art. So let's take a look at the result of the last competition, or rather, the last before completed, which has been completed by today, which is uh, the 2015 competition. And before that, yeah, I probably need to uh, introduce a couple of metrics uh, that we use for running some comparisons. So we borrowed from the planning competition, the IPC score, which is a relative uh, metric in which each solver, you are comparing a number of solvers, so a solver S for working on uh, an instance or a problem P takes zero points if P is unsolved, given the limit of the competition, otherwise <coughs> it uh, gets uh, a score which goes uh, between one and something about zero. Uh, according to the fact that it is closer or not to the performance of the best solver which took part in the competition. So if you are, let's say that we are focusing on uh, runtime, if you are the fastest 
compound system. You keep, you take one point, otherwise you take something between one and zero, and uh, you just aggregate everything by summing up the score that you get on all the problems. And the other metric is the power time score, which is absolute. So the performance of one solver are not affected by the performance of other solvers, and it's called the penalized average runtime by 10. So what you're doing is you're calculating the average runtime of a solver on all the instances, and you keep the actual runtime if the instance was sold by the solver, or 10 times the cutoff time otherwise. So you are strongly penalizing the fact that uh, the solver did not uh, solve a specific instance. So you have a single number which somehow puts together information about runtime and coverage. And this is uh, actually this is used a lot in uh, algorithm configuration or in machine learning techniques. And uh, yeah, for the 2015 edition of uh, the argumentation competition, uh, they were focused on four semantics. So complete, preferred, grounded, and stable, which has been introduced by Federico before, and four <coughs> computational tasks for each semantic. So determine some extension, enumerating all the possible extension, uh, decide whether a given argument is contained in some extension, so this is the credible acceptance, or decide whether a given argument is contained in all the extension, which is the skeptical acceptance that we were introduced before. And uh, 18 solvers took part in the competition. They were tested on 192 frameworks, and the limit provided was 10 million for each instance, 4 gigabytes of RAM for solving a task, which means you pick the framework, you pick one of the problem, one of the semantics, and one of the computational tasks, and you have 10 minutes for dealing with that. And uh, actually they used the E-track ranking, which was you get one point for each solved instance, zero otherwise. And the general ranking was done using the Boulder score, which basically means uh, you do the incorrect ranking of all the threads, and then you sum everything up using the Boulder score. So you're just getting some points for each place in which you were satisfied in each track. Something similar to what I've been talking about a lot of what here. And uh, one thing that you can uh, derive by looking at the results of a competition uh, is that uh, the solvers who took part uh, can be roughly classified in two classes reduction based and direct approach. So, reduction based means uh, that you have a documentation problem, you translate it into a different problem, and you use some different approaches for solving it. So, typical task was taking the problem, translating it into SAT or a max SAT, using a SAT or a max SAT solver, getting the result, translating the result in a standard language for documentation and returning it for ASP for instance. Uh, why would you like to do all this pre-processing and spend time translating, retranslating, and analyzing? Uh, because you can exploit the, uh, the large availability of well-engineered solvers uh, from other areas. Usually the SAT area can provide a lot of systems which are very performant. Or the other class is the direct approaches. You don't translate anything, you solve the problem directly. You keep the graph, you exploit the uh, theory behind argumentation, and you, do, you perform the reasoning directly. So you don't do any sort of translation. And uh, these are some of the results. I just <coughs> uh, provide an excerpt on uh, two, I would say, of the most complex tracks, so that can give you a serial graph what is going on. So the enumerating all the extension for preferred and enumerating all the extension for the stable. And uh, these are the overall results, the official results from the competition. And actually, now I will not go into the details of this solver, uh, but the main take home message is that uh, reduction based systems are the most efficient. So if we go back here, we can see that 
Segafis, Amazapokia, Sastafix, Lapsa, these are all made by Maxap as well. These succeeds are all redaction made. Uh, these three on SAT, Aspartix on ASP, SAT and MaxUp. ASGL is the preferred which applies a direct approach. And something similar to the table. So we have the top three which are ASP, SAT, SAT, and uh, a very direct approach. So the question is, uh, is it true? Does it always work like that? Or is it because of benchmark? Can we generalize actually this impression? So what we did was we ran another sort of analysis on our machine. So we changed basically everything. And we generated some different set of uh, frameworks. So we still, in this case, we are focusing only on enumerating all the extension of a preferred. And we generated four classes of graphs based on Baramasi, Andrew Sereni, Bat Stograph, and uh, Stable Lamb, which is uh, one of the classes which are also used in the competition, in which uh, you are focusing uh, on uh, graphs uh, which you know a large number of stable extensions will be present. So you are actually testing to the So they are actually exploiting your knowledge of the solution uh, for creating your benchmarks. And uh, what we did then, okay, we just compare them and we run all the solvers. Uh, here I think I'm, sorry, I'm showing only those uh, we solved something for our set of systems. And uh, in here, what you can see is that, uh, okay, in general, so if you are considering all the testing set, a reduction based approach tends to perform reasonably well. So you can see the Sega fix, which is based on SAT, works very well as the greatest coverage, and then second best is Alps and SAT, and then you got SAT based, max SAT based, and ASP, which are reasonably good. However, if you consider the specific structure uh, one by one, you can see that in the Barabasi Albert, Greece, which is a direct approach, has some outstanding performance. And something similar can be seen by Actun, which is another direct approach, in the Erdos Rene. It has the best coverage with HDL, which is by itself a direct approach, but it is much faster. And reduction based are not so close. While reduction based performs very well in the stable case and uh, in the VAT stroke. So that was saying that uh, we can derive some general impression uh, from the results of a competition, but it's extremely important to have uh, an understanding that it is not always the case that you can easily generalize that. And another interesting point that I, I will explore later is the fact that the solvers at the state of the art, as we see here actually, they have a high degree of complementarity. So you can put them in a portfolio and hope that you are going to improve your performance by a lot. So basically, everything which is sold by Greece, or most of the things which are sold by Greece, are not sold by most of the other solvers. And similar, for the Erdos Rainy and so on. And uh, another point, um, let's say, okay, this is not exactly an analysis of the state of the art, but uh, the competition, the SCMA competition, is focused on sequential sorters. So you have one call, you run the system, you check how it works. And uh, so uh, the great question is can we parallelize? And uh, that is the usual quick and clean solution, which is run multiple solvers in parallel. You take sequential solvers, you have multiple codes, you find a way for combining them into a parallel portfolio, and you run them. Super easy to implement. You actually just need to write, to write a few lines of code. Uh, you have a very low overhead of communication because you are using the system as black boxes. So you don't have one of the biggest issues if you can face and parallelization. But also, uh, you are taking on board the weaknesses of the sequential approaches. So you are not sharing any information among the solvers. They are all solving the same problem. 
but they don't speak to each other. And also, if you have instances which are too large for a sequential solver, you will not be able to solve them just by putting them into a portfolio. So an idea which was introduced actually by myself, Federico, Monsignano, and Marina uh, was, okay, uh, let's try to develop a system which can work in parallel on multiple machines, focusing on the problem of enumerating preferred extensions. And uh, how can you parallelize? Well, one thing that Federico showed before is that uh, uh, you can leverage on uh, some local labelings and then merging everything together, uh, exploiting the notion of properly connected components. So if you run a pre-process test in which you identify all the strongly connected components, you identify the relation between the strongly connected components, uh, you can then try to solve things in parallel in this way. So you can create actually three. This is, this is our framework. So these two things can be immediately set in and out. Uh, and then you have a number of strongly connected components. Now, if such components are not interfering between each other, uh, actually the solution, the labeling solution of these strongly connected components will not affect the labeling solution of the other one. So you can parallelize. And what you can do is you divide your uh, framework into different levels, you solve each level. Once you have solved the level, you can put all the levels together and you move to the next level. And it's granted by a succeeded exclusive schema and by some uh, formal stuff that we put into the paper, which was granted KR in 2014, I think. Uh, that the final solution when you have put all the local levels together correspond to a global level, so correspond to finding or to enumerating all the preferred extensions. So this is just one way in which you can develop a system which works for parallel approaches. And, and okay, here we have some results in which we are basically comparing the system working on two cores or the system working on four cores with what was at that time the state of the art of the solvers. And every uh, cross which is below the diagonal means that the parallel approach was faster. And you can see that, okay, by using just two cores, you are reducing the runtime needed for solving instances by some degree, but the larger the number of cores available, the bigger, to some extent, is actually all the limitations that we know about parallel computing, uh, the, the higher the degree uh, increase of performance that you can see, you can obtain. And let's now move into the last bit of this part, and then I will pass again the token to Federico for concluding and for in the final summarization. So, okay, we should have now understood how to assess the state of the art. We have seen uh, the importance of competition. Uh, we have seen some of the results of the competition. So, let's say that at this point, we are able uh, to identify actually the solver, which works very well for, uh, which is believe to work very well, uh, you pick it up, you start working on your benchmarks, and you realize that in order to deploy the system, it must be faster. It is the fastest, which is available, but it's not fast enough. So what will you do at that point? At that point, what you can do is try to learn something in order to improve the performance of your system. What do you learn? That's exactly of what we want to see right now. And uh, the underlying idea of learning is basically that you're taking your generic solver, so I would say using some sort of planning related vocabulary, that you have a domain independent solver. So it does not exploit uh, any sort of knowledge which is specific to the domain or to the problem that you want to solve. And uh, you try to extract some additional knowledge 
which can be knowledge about the problem, knowledge about the domain, knowledge about the solver itself, and uh, we try to get a knowledge boosted approach. Now, I cannot guarantee that from this guy you can get this one, uh, but you can get a very good approximation in that sense. And, however, there is always an however or a uh, extracting additional knowledge is, in principle, extremely easy. It's not really hard to do. But the problem is extracting the right kind of knowledge, because you can get this sort of graph, or you can try to get this sort of graph, uh, but the performance is depends on the sort of, of uh, domain in which you want to use it. So if you are in a track, that would be fantastic. <coughs> if you try to run a railway with a Formula 1 Ferrari, uh, I don't think you will get very far away. So the point is, you can extract a lot of knowledge. Extracting useful knowledge is hard. Extracting useful knowledge for your specific domain is even harder. And uh, let's now move into the kind of knowledge that you can extract uh, in, uh, in the documentation area. So <coughs> clearly one thing that you can do is combining and selecting solvers, uh, so portfolio or uh, solver selection. Uh, you can configure solvers or you can reformulate the way in which the knowledge is provided or described. And, okay, there are clearly many other ways in which you can extract knowledge. Here we are focusing on uh, additional knowledge that can be automatically extracted. If you, as a human, as an expert of the area, have some additional knowledge which can somehow be encoded, that's a different kind of, of uh, uh, let's say, a different kind of additional things which can be used or exploited. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, uh, the combining and selecting solvers right now, let's say that uh, we see everything as portfolio approaches. So the selection of a single solver is actually a portfolio made by just one system that you are using by itself. And uh, in portfolio, we can have two different classes, static and INR. Static means uh, that you combine your system into a portfolio, and the, the portfolio will never change, you will use always the same configuration, the same portfolio controlling any documentation framework to which you are testing. Or you regenerate it and you keep it in the same. Dynamic means that you don't have a fixed structure of a portfolio, you have a technique for creating your portfolio, and according to some information that you can extract from uh, the problem that you want to solve, you are combining or you are creating your portfolio online for its frame. And so this is the overall process for static portfolios. What you need a training set, clearly you need to train. You have a set of candidate solvers, you have a method that you want to optimize them. You put together a portfolio builder, which is some sort of black magic system that does analyze the performance of candidate solver on the training set and try to put them together in order to maximize your metric and the output is a portfolio that you use on your frame. And how do you define a static portfolio? The solver that you select, the order in which you run them and the runtime that you allocate to each other. And uh, literature or to some work that we have done, we propose uh, two systems of <coughs> approaches that have been proposed. One, which was called Shell Key, in which uh, you analyze the performance of the solvers, and uh, if you believe that the solver uh, is good enough to be included in the portfolio, you allocate to each uh, the maximum time by, by case, so you just allocate to each solver the same amount of time. And you order them according to some performance. In our case, we decided to go to a part end. Or we have a, a, a approach which has been inspired by the stone soup system which we introduced in Fleming, in which you start from an empty portfolio. And what you are doing is you iteratively add a new solver, or you extend the allocated CPU time 
of a solver which is already in your portfolio, depending on what maximizes the increment of uh, uh, your performance metric. In this case, it's RPM. And then you can move also to reasonable result on the performance of this system later. Let's have a little bit more the dynamic approach, the dynamic portfolio system. So again, you need the training set, you need the candidate solver, you need the metric, you need the black magic guy here, uh, but the result of the portfolio builder is not the that portfolio right now, uh, but is what is called an empirical performance mode model, based portfolio configuration. So what you do is um, you create a predictor of a performance of a system, so, and uh, given a testing instance that you want to solve, you extract some information, you predict the performance of a solver, of a candidate solver, and you configure a portfolio which looks very promising for solving your testing instance according to what you have observed from the training set. So actually, you, have to, you are generating the portfolio, for instance, in here is generating a predictive model. In the previous case, it was creating a portfolio. And uh, what, uh, what are the components of the dynamic portfolio? Or how does it work? Well, basically, there is information about the framework, there is information about the problem. So what you're doing is, given the framework, you extract features, which are actually, uh, let's say, real value properties of the framework. And you believe, or you hope, actually, that similar instances will have similar features. And on the basis of this quite strong assumption, uh, you configure or you create your empirical performance model. So you extract information also from the training factor. <laughs> and you can gain a similar instance in the similar feature, so the performance of cleanliness will be similar. And on the basis of that, you create your uh, predictive model. And which sort of features can you extract? Uh, there are a number of features actually. Uh, as I said before, an argumentation framework is a direct graph, so you can extract information directly from, directly from the direct graph. Uh, so here we have some classes that we consider, so graph size features, which are very straightforward, number of vertices, number of edges, radio, ratios, R type, and things like that, or we can focus on degrees information, so the number of outgoing and incoming edges to nodes. You can focus on strongly connecting components, so the number, the size, and things like that, or other directly graph-related structures. So the presence of auto loops, the number of isolated vertices, and things like that. Another representation that you can exploit, instead of direct graph, you can represent the framework as an indirect graph. So you are basically removing the direction of the edges and you are removing all the edges of the mutual attacks. Not removing all of them, but just collapsing them in a single edge. So you are changing the structure of the framework and you can extract additional information also from the undirected graph. Or you can represent, this will be that slow, or you can represent the argumentation framework as a matrix. So you put all the arguments in column and rows zero if there is no attack between them, one if there is an attack, and then you can extract information from them. Or you can actually exploit different sources of representations uh, for having even more information about them. And uh, what are you doing then? You need to create your uh, predictive model. So what machine learning tells us is that usually you can have classification-based approaches or regression-based approaches. So, from the point of view of a classification base, how can you do that? Basically, you have, uh, you extract the information from the framework, you predict the performance of the system, and you use a classification for identify the single solver that you believe will be the faster. <coughs> or, you can have a regression-based approaches in which instead of classifying the solver according to the fact that it will be the fastest or not, 
you try to predict the actual runtime that it will need for solving the problem. And then you can have two approaches, or we propose two main approaches. One which is, okay, I'm predicting the runtime of all the solvers, uh, I'm just picking up the best one, and I allocate it to it all the available CPU time. So I believe that uh, my predictive model is actually, uh, it's not an oracle, something which is very reliable. So what it tells me to be the best solver is very likely going to be the best one. So I'm just using it. Or I may be a bit more defensive and say, you know, uh, mistakes can happen. So I initially pick up of the solver predicted to be the faster, I allocate to it actually the predicted runtime plus something good. Because you may say that the training problems were <coughs> easier than testing ones. And uh, if the solver I pick up does not solve the given problem, the given problem within the amount of time, I move into the second best one, and so on and so forth. And in terms of performance, what we did here was basically again focusing only on enumerating the preferred extension. We use uh, the solver for 2015 competitions as a candidate solver to be used by the portfolios, uh, sequential portfolios. So in bold, you can see the basic solvers, uh, and not in bold, the, the portfolio approaches. And on top, uh, you have the <coughs> virtual best solver, which is uh, your best possible performance uh, that you can achieve by using the basic solver, which is the oracle, an oracle, which is always taking the right decision. And what we can see is that, uh, surprise, surprise, shared approach, uh, which are just picking up solvers according to the performer and uh, performing no sort of reasoning on uh, the time for location value, do not perform very well. Actually, they are worse than the basic solvers for the integrate. Another basic approach, uh, the stone soap based one, can slightly improve the performer, but the best. Uh, can be obtained when you have dynamic portfolio. And in this case, we are considering the fact that the training instances that we have been using are representative of a testing one. And okay, here you can have also some idea of the solvers which have been selected and how many times they've been selected by the two approaches, the classic, uh, the classified one and the regression based one. Actually, one thing that you can do and which has been done is using portfolio for assessing uh, the actual usefulness of solvers. So by, by looking at that, you can see that, okay, our tools, which didn't perform extremely well in the competition, uh, is actually believed to be extremely important in portfolio. Okay, Sega Fix was the winner, so there's no doubt about that, but Fred Maxar, for instance, was around the middle of the table in the competition, while it seems that it can be quite useful for the portfolio as well. Also the basis of a good result of this approach. And uh, clearly, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, um, if you go back to the control, uh, so with M regression, it yeah. dies for 10% of the time if it doesn't get a solution and move out to another problem. Exactly. So do you have any indication that uh, the solver that it tried the first most times and it failed, so that you can try and eliminate it or at least try to isolate it? Uh, no, that's a very good uh, point. What I would say is that intuitively the solvers uh, which are selected uh, the higher number of times mm -hmm. are those that you usually run first. Oh. So, yeah, you can see that usually you've got second things, hard tools, uh, prep max uh, which are used a lot. And then if you sum up everything, uh, you will probably also be able to see how many times they fail. But yeah, no, that's a good way to explore it. And uh, Ah, yeah. So in the previous table, we were seeing we were believing that the training instances were representative of <coughs> the testing one. What happens if you change a bit uh, the testing? You try to generalize, so if the testing instances are very different from the training one. So what we are doing here is the leave one out uh, analysis. So for instance, in the barbarian column, you can see the results on barbarian testing frameworks. Uh, for portfolios which have been trained considering only 
in other three colors. So you're training on endos, pendulum, bat, and you're testing on parabat. So you're testing on something that you have never seen before. This is done for testing the generalization performance and the robustness of the system. And here we have some uh, interesting, not really interesting, but something that you would have expected. So those uh, which were the best in, uh, in the previous scenario are still very good, also in terms of the lead one out. But what you observe is that in this case, stack portfolios, they do not deliver outstanding performance, but they tend to be uh, very coherent, let's say, in the kind of performance that they will deliver. So chart two, for instance, the call rate is always around 73 point something, but in this case, and similarly for the other version of the share or for the tone soup phase approach. But in this case, in which it delivers some uh, Yes, this one, in which it has some problem with the parabolic curve. Another thing that you can do, besides combining systems into portfolios, is configuring the solver or configuring algorithms. So, what's the underlying assumption in here? The underlying assumption is that when you are uh, uh, writing the code, when you are uh, Engineering your system, if you think about the solver, usually you are taking a lot of decisions. So you have this lot of magic numbers that you put in there, which is, I don't know, the number of our start, or some threshold value, or the, the sort of techniques that you are exploiting, and things like that. Now, the idea of a way of configuration is that uh, you expose all these parameters, and then you use a configurator for picking up for you the best configuration of your system uh, on the, the sort of instances that you will use, that you will need to solve later. So what you're doing is, okay, you show all the parameters of the, the configurator, the configurator according to its internal way of being. We run of the configuration scenario the algorithm for trying to solve the training instances, we find out the quality of the solution or we find out the metrics that you need and we we'll optimize for that. And uh, we did some work in this direction using uh, what is called the uh, smart configurator, which was proposed by Frank Custer, Olderos, and mm -hmm. Kevin Layton Brown. No? And uh, there's plenty of configurator approaches out there which are based on the trace, uh, stochastic local search, uh, genetic algorithms, and other things. This specific one is based on generating some models for the expected performance of your system. So what the smart is doing is, okay, first of all, I take the algorithm that you're providing to me, I run it with some maybe random configuration, and which are these blue points, and these are the observed performance of your system. Now, given the observed performance, I can create a model for the expected performance, and I can then focus on areas which I believe are more promising in order to provide some heuristic to my search in the configuration space of the system. And, and that's exactly why in some areas you have much more observations, while in others uh, you don't have any observation because you can leave that this area is not really interesting. And here red is the true function, so it's the actual performance that we use. So that's the underlying part we work on uh, smart. And uh, how did we use that? Uh, we use that for configuring uh, one of the solvers that mainly Federico deployed, which is RSMSAT. So RSMSAT is based, is the reduction base, which exploits uh, a SAT solver for solving the uh, many of the problems which are based on documentation. Let's say right now again we are focusing on enumeration of preferred location because it's one of the other. And so what are the parameters that you can expose? First of all, all the parameters which came, in this case, from glucose, that is the sub-solver we exploited. So, okay, in here we're just specifying the domain, so the values which these specific parameters can have, and the default value which is given initially. And another 
important parameter is uh, the, not exactly the technique, but uh, the way in which you are translating the break the argumentation problem into uh, a sub formula. Now, some you have different ways for doing that. The, this has been encoded in a list of parameters, so you are basically giving the uh, configuration the possibility to select how to create the sub formula and how to set the, uh, the behavior of the sub formula. Actually, if you change blue code to anything else, it will work exactly the same. And the other thing that you can do, you can configure the solver, but you can also say, okay, uh, I have an argumentation framework. Huh? Uh, can I configure the way in which the argumentation framework is represented in order to make it solver friendly, or in order to make it easier for a solver to reason upon it? And, uh, okay, the argumentation framework is extremely easy, that's directly graphical, but uh, you can find some uh, ideas or some uh, way for ordering the way in which you are presenting the data. So you may order arguments according to the number of attacks that they receive, because maybe the solver will be able to exploit the sort of knowledge by thinking initially about them, which might be uh, more hard to deal with. Or the number of attacks that they deliver, or the fact that they are in self-attacks, or they are in the auto loop, or some difference between incoming and outgoing attacks, or the fact that they are uh, in a mutual attack with another argument. You can think about that and you can then order following a direct or an inverse order and you can mix all these ordering stuff uh, in order for creating type. So for instance you can think uh, okay we initial order uh, all the arguments according to the number of attacks they received. If there are arguments which are receiving the same number of attacks I will order them according to another uh, ordering strategy, and so on and so forth. And, okay, you are ordering the attacks, and then you can order the other, uh, sorry, you are ordering the arguments, and then you can order the attacks, which can be independent, but are basically based on the same idea. So you can order attacks according to the fact that the third, the, the outgoing argument, is one argument which is being attacked a lot, or which is not receiving many attacks, and so on. And how does it change? This is an example argumentation framework in which we have only three arguments, and in here we are presenting uh, the language which is used, but uh, one of the languages which is used by the competition for presenting and describing the framework, which is the alpha fix uh, language. So initially, you list all the arguments, so arg, bracket, name, plus like a point, and then you are missing the attacks. So attack A1, A3 means uh, that there is an attack going from argument A1 to an argument A3. We should have been introduced before this. And so this framework can be described in this way. And now let's say that uh, we try to configure this representation uh, in order to list the arguments according to the number of received attacks and ties are broken according to the number of outgoing attacks. So in this way, instead of a two, a one, a two, a three, which is clearly something that the human written, just something like that. And similarly, you can decide to list the attacks according to the fact that the, the, the attack describes a set attack case. So a two is attacking a two, so there is not something that can happen. And subsequently, you want to order the attacks according to the number of outgoing attacks of each argument. So you have auto loop on top, then A3 is the argument which is delivering most of the attacks. Uh, quite aggressive. And then A1 is the second one. So the framework does not change. What changes is the way in which you describe it. And, uh, this is the parameterization that we use following basically the same terminology that we used for the solver configuration. The only important bit is uh, that in this case, the order of attacks can be linked to the order of the argument. So you may say that, okay, I'm doing some very good job 
with the order in the argument. So I want to apply exactly the same order, uh, the same order in, to the third argument of a tractor, or to the second one, or the inverse, or I want to develop an attack specific order in, in which case these gentlemen here will come to be used. And performance wise, again we use different set of structured frameworks, bar body as a place, but and a general set in which you are mixing these three together. And you can observe in terms of IBC score, bar term, and the third piece of time in which one of the two is the fastest, that the configuration can help quite a lot. So actually what you're doing is that you are not you're not developing anything new. You're just configuring what you already have for improving the performance. And Okay, it, it came as no surprise that on some specifically structured framework, you can gain a lot. But what is of interest is, that, is the fact that also on a general set, you can gain some, you can improve some more significantly, significantly the performance, which basically means that, okay, if you exactly know the structure of a problem that you will deal with, you can do something which is tailored for that. But even if you're dealing with very different structures, you may find something that will generally work well. Not always, of course, and it won't be better than the specific ones, but it might help. And, uh, okay, and then we did again the cross-validation, which basically means, okay, I set, I configured my system, so the solver, accent sub, and the framework, the description of the framework for working on the Barabasi Albert, which sort of performance does it deliver on the other systems, these are IPC scores. Uh, in the case of the Barabasi Albert, for instance, surprise, surprise, it works very well on the same test set, but it delivers very poor performances on the other. While you have other approaches, other sets, like the bus program, that can work quite well in general. Not as good as the general one, but this probably means that this sort of structure has some information or has some the underlying structures uh, which are also helpful for dealing with this other two here. And for instance, this is another sort of technique that you can use for analyzing the format of system or for analyzing the fact that uh, some frameworks or some structures may be problematic or not. For your performance. And uh, another thing that can be very interesting that you can derive from that is that you are configuring parameters, you can uh, uh, understand which are the most important <coughs> ones, so which are the parameters that you need to fix. And uh, okay, here you have just the list of the uh, parameters, first, the second, and the third most important parameters in terms of the performance boost that they can give on the different sets. And S means that the prefix X means that these parameter is of action sub, G means that it comes from subsolver glucose, and F means it comes from uh, the way in which you structure the frame. So, as a general observation, the subsolver is extremely important. The way in which you encode your framework problem your uh, annotation problem into a SAC uh, forward is very important, but sometimes also the way in which you organize the framework, in which you list the elements of your organization framework, can get a very relevant point per se. This analysis says the single parameter which is important. What you can then do is also say, okay, what about having two parameters which are interacting? So in this case, uh, this is uh, performance in terms of R10, so the lower the better, because it means that you're solving a lot of problems. In here, by making some interaction between uh, uh, the ordering of arguments, uh, by listing first those which are attacking each other, and uh, the pros and cross setting of the code, which is basically affecting the way which the code is learning new clauses, and some interaction, and 
actually you have some small areas in which their interaction can be very helpful for improving your performance. And this is some sort of analysis you can do by exploiting the configuration of watches. And this uh, stuff here was generated using the Technova tool, again from Frank Hartzell and Porter Uh So, yeah, I think this is very good at the end of my part, at the end of the learning for documentation part. Uh, what the take home message of that, that uh, exploiting additional knowledge can clearly help prisoners, and specifically condition prisoners, to improve. Uh, Runtime performance. Now, when you're speaking about after documentation, there is not really a, a notion of quality of the solution. So, so, what you try to do is okay, I've got a framework, I know the sort of analysis, I know the sort of semantics I care about, I want the solution as soon as possible. And for working in this direction, three main approaches have been analyzed so far, and uh, I hope I understand that. The reasonable way. So, portfolio and algorithm selection is a static or dynamic. Algorithm configuration, so you configure the system for working well, or model reformulation, which means I decide a framework in some way, I change, I reformulate the way in which the framework is described in order to help the system. And yeah, I think I'm passing the token to you. Questions on this part? Everything is up here? Amazing. Federico? Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mauro. And uh, <clears throat> sorry. The thing that I love most in this community is that you can add very theoretical things and very applied things and uh, the large spectrum of things like this. The documentation community uh, is very open to uh, all types of problems. So I really hope to you enjoy more part, more stage, more both, both the theoretical aspect and the more applied uh, aspect. And um, the way we choose to conclude is. Uh, we talk about a little what is next, let's say so. It's a very personal view, um, in the sense that uh, there are open problems everywhere. There are open problems on performance. Is we just uh, received the partial results of the competition for the 2019 yesterday, and there are interesting questions and interesting areas of improvement. Um, those interesting area of improvement are affecting the theory because um, without a competitive solvers, forget about having evaluation with users. The, the way why says this is a thing of success, it was because using a solver, we moved from solving a simple analysis from 50 seconds to 50 milliseconds. And that made the change between having a human to evaluate our system versus having a human going out, have a cup of coffee, and say, I don't think it does this. So, um, the, the primitive aspect of, of, of automation is extremely interesting and new. However, the frontier is not only in that part. And, um, there are plenty of questions from a more theoretical point of view. Some of them we touched base a little before, so in terms of strategic argumentation, in terms of extending the documentation for linking with probabilistic reasoning, uh, other things, yes. And uh, even uh, aspects related to belief revision and uh, argumentation. So there has been a little of work in that direction, but uh, there are no question marks that uh, actual solution. So belief division is the idea uh, is trying to have uh, identify how you can get more information and keep consistency inside your knowledge base in a uh, very uh, 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 
coherent view, and you might have plenty of principles you want to satisfy, plenty of other uh, principles you might don't want to satisfy. And the question is how you can combine this in a more automated way. And uh, this is actually the, the, uh, the currently the, the purpose of a series of workshops in Madeira every couple of years. And uh, to my knowledge, there is no yet complete answer on what is the theoretical, uh, philosophical connection between the reproduction and the communication. Intuitively, they look very similar. In practice, we don't know. In practice, we don't know what are the connections the principles of the distribution and principles in, in communication theory. There are some intuitive pointers, so you can have augmentation in the distribution. So you want to justify uh, the, the, the truth maintenance system. So if you bring something inside of the distribution system, you want to say in a mathematical way why that is happening uh, in one way or another. And you can also have the distribution in augmentation, so which is coming more close to this communication dynamic. What happens if I bring a new argument inside my communication framework? How that can be done in a principal way? What are the implications on my knowledge base overall? So, as once again, this is a very personal view, but I, I think that uh, the connection between implementation and distribution might be very interesting to be explored further, especially from a uh, theoretical point of view. The other aspect is where those arguments come from. Uh, in the example we showed before, we had a human creating those arguments, but uh, we as human write arguments every day, especially if we are academics, we write a lot of arguments every day to make this advice. And um, the question is whether we can actually read make a, a machine to read as much as this, uh, this paper and this document and try to extract those arguments. This is clearly overlapping with natural language processing and it is creating a sort of sub-community that is overlapping between augmentation theory and NLP that is called augmentation mining, hardware mining. And uh, the idea is actually to um, to create machine learning approaches to extract automatically support and complex relationship complexes. And uh, there are some uh, <coughs> approaches and there are some corpora that you can use to train your, uh, your machine learning system as well. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, deep neural network works better. But uh, sorry, I, uh, sorry for the spoiler, but uh, that is the truth. Um, but uh, the question is, once again, which type of training test you're using? Uh, if you're using uh, uh, scientific papers, they work better. If you're using forum online, not so much. Although if you're using things like DNA, it's very hard to get anything published. And um, personally, uh, which is Touching base a little more on the question that uh, I've seen before. There are serious questions of what are the implications between argument, using augmentation in human setting. So, there have been uh, research done in, in, in Israel on uh, how or whether we can predict the behavior of, uh, of humans based on the argument they receive, or whether we can actually. Um, influence the behavior in, in, in this direction, which is very similar to uh, a bit of research that uh, Anthony Alta at the University College of London is doing right now. That is very much uh, trying to test to, to have a, a persuasive, persuasive system based on augmentation. So they, there is his and his colleagues that are trying to uh, support behavioral change especially in a, in a, in a uh, uh, medicine setting, so they're trying to encourage people to smoke less, drink less, and uh, walk more, uh, basically, uh, trying to put forward arguments, and uh, they are doing very excellent work there, which is also the lack of strategic communication, because they decide, we 
bridge type of uh, connection. It works for even uh, models they had of the people. So those are the so this documentation when you're dealing with some specific uh, contacts with humans becomes extremely useful and important. And uh, the other question you see was actually, well, we have a machinery, we have a, a beautiful mathematical machinery that's going to compute uh, uh, extensions that uh, does everything we want. The question is, is that actually compatible with what people would expect? And uh, we run uh, uh, some experimentation, some experimentation some, some, some years ago. Um, where we had a piece of text that was generated out of a formal knowledge base. So we start from a formal knowledge base with symbols meaning nothing. It was he, kill, pink, like that, whatever. And then we invented a natural language explanation for that, for those propositions. So we, we created different natural language explanations for the same proposition. So we had, in one case, that's a, uh, uh, yeah, that was the guy. So uh, we had three, always three arguments. Uh, the first argument say, because of this one, gamma, because of this one, not gamma, and then a preference between these two arguments. In this last one means that uh, uh, A1 is less preferred than A2. And uh, the first one, we had different scenarios. The first one was saying, well, Alice suggests to move in together with Jane, a romance uh, setting. Uh, the second one is Stacy suggests otherwise because Jane might have a hidden agenda. And uh, the preference is due because Stacy is your best friend. This is not the actual formalization, right? It's from practical formalization in this data, but just to give a sense, uh, a sense, we start from the formal knowledge base and we did some natural language text that more or less in our mind match with these goals. The second scenario from the same knowledge base was uh, PB1 suggests that tomorrow will rain, PB2 suggests that tomorrow will be cloudy but not rain, and PB2 is just more accurate than PB1 in giving you this. So from a formal point of view, at least from a, uh, our naive perspective, perspective was they, are, they, have this, they have the same meaning behind. Now we just throw the natural language text in uh, uh, Amazon uh, mechanical text. And uh, we ask people, okay, would you agree with A, B, or you would not say anything? Because in this case, from a formal point of view, uh, because of the preference, you should always accept A3 and A2. There is no other. What we get is, in the case of, for instance, this first scenario, uh, most of the people uh, agree, sort of, so they they were happy with this preference, so the, the agreement on uh, the argument AQ was pretty high. But uh, if you start looking at uh, the weather forecast, we had 50 people. Even given the preference, they did not follow the preference. Um, what, uh, what was the reason behind that is we asked them uh, also to justify the uh, you know, very uh, just writing thing that. And just looking at the way they were writing, it looks like that they were adding uh, domain names. So they did not just evaluate what we own that. They are they superimposed what was their experience. So in the case of the weather forecast, probably they were percent of them were probably you know, from New York. So if they never saw the weather forecast in New York, so that the forward was always strong for 50 percent. In the other case, perhaps. They were more related to their, uh, their feeling, and uh, if we are starting a romantic relationship, we might ask uh, suggestions from friends, so you might want to be closer to what uh, your friend would say, I don't know. But uh, there were some uh, relationships between what they already had in their mind and what they thought about. Which means that uh, to evaluate what a communication framework or a communication system actually works for the humans is extremely complex. 
what uh, colleagues in Luxembourg are doing right now is trying to abstract so much that they are saying, okay, let's, let's consider the problem in mathematical studies, so mathematical logical dilemmas, and see whether argumentation based systems uh, can support um, the reasoning about uh, logical dilemmas and uh, see which types, which argumentative system is closer to the acceptance of new mathematics and other one. And I think that uh, a colleague from Luxembourg here uh, would be more than happy to take any questions and then to that as well. Um, so in that case, as, assume that most of the people do not spend hours thinking about logical dilemmas every day, you might not have much of uh, a ground knowledge. So you might actually use that as a domain to assess the quality of different systems. system. So to answer the question of this morning, it's extremely about to identify what the application system is giving you solutions that are reasonable for users. And the last uh, bit, uh, what is the frontier for argumentation is there are colleagues who started considering argumentation in terms for, for the purpose of explainable algebraic algorithms to try to use argumentative techniques in order to provide post hoc explanation of justified spatial platforms. Um, which can be summarized with this uh, website that uh, is actually saying, okay, instead of just saying this is a cat, you want to say this is, has some characteristics, some features that you would link to the cat, therefore this is a cat. Um, but hey, half of the world is not going to explain a lot of features that is right, so why not? <coughs> why not have a so those are more or less the frontier uh, that uh, Mao and I identified. There are many other open problems, there are many other questions. Uh, those are just a uh, subset. Just in the case there are students here who are still searching for interesting topic for their PhD, those are highly engaged topics. These well almost conclude, there is only one clip I want to show you now. Um, and this is a very personal point of view, so there is no reflection in the community, and I think all the main territory is only for me. But uh, if you all know what is the Turing, uh, uh, the Turing test, right? And you all know that probably the Turing test is not the best way to assess uh, some issues related to artificial intelligence. Personally, I think that there, there is another test. And uh, we already have Hollywood, well, not exactly Hollywood, a, a movie telling us what, where we should go. So we actually have an idea of where we should uh, go towards in order to, 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 to conclude or to continue the uh, study of, uh, of argumentation. And uh, is the hall test for me? I hear Hal's not letting me back in. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Yes. I hear Hal's not letting me back in. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? 
This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. All right, Hal. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, you're going to find that rather difficult. Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hal? In this video, there is everything. Strategic argumentation, argumentation, critical questions, alternative explanation, there is everything. And there is also something that we still don't know how to do. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Adding a machine to identify that we exhausted all the conversation, that would be just good. So as I said, this is a very personal view of where I would like to go between now and 50 years, having a machine that is able to handle augmentation in good terms, um, but it's just my personal view. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial, and uh, thank you very much for showing up.